Hey, welcome to the show. I'm sitting here today with Amy K. Hutchins. Amy K., how are you doing today? I'm fabulous, Travis. How are you? I'm doing just as fabulous as can be. I know it's a Monday when we're recording this. It's probably ain't coming out to like, I don't know, end of February, but so excited to be here. I'm in Oklahoma City. It's like December 6th, and it was like 40 degrees today. It was 85 yesterday, but 40 today. But I'm so excited to have you on the show today, Amy K., because of how much energy you bring. That smile is infectious. Folks, if you are listening to this right now, I you know, implore you to hit pause or stop and jump to the video because this smile and energy that Amy K has, you don't want to miss it. Oh, I just bring the San Diego sunshine and you're having our San Diego weather too. So we are, we're like in our own little pot of sunshine goodness right now. Oh, absolutely. I'm just so excited to be here. Amy K is the author of Get It, The Five Steps to the Sex, Salary, and Success that You Want. Check out all the things that she's doing at amyk.com. But really, we're going to talk about more specifically things related to shegetsit.com. But this is for everybody. I was breezing right through her books. It's like having a conversation with her in person. Uh, absolutely love everything about it. But the tools and the techniques and the things you talk about are relevant to everybody. And no kidding, they're relevant to me right now. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Amy Kay, and why you wrote the book. Travis, I think one of the things that is so hard sometimes for us to acknowledge is that where our greatest gift is often where our greatest pain is. And so I was this shy, introverted kid, and I got into theater, which allowed me to perform on stage. But theater is actually a very introverted exercise because it's you and the script and your characters, and you're doing it though from stage. And so one of the things that I realized very quickly was that the more that I mastered my voice box in real life off stage, the easier that my life was. And so I was like the classic kid who'd put your foot in your mouth or who didn't know what to say, or who'd think of like the perfect thing to say six hours later when it was way too late. And so as I got older, I really started to believe that if I don't master this voice box that I was given, that we've all been given, of course it didn't come with instructions, but if we master this voice box, we can actually master our life. And so for, wow, almost 30 years now, I've been preaching that life happens one conversation at a time. And I've been helping leaders to own those conversations. And I love it. I'm absolutely just as passionate about it today as when I started, because I just feel it's just an imperative to our success. I don't even know where to go from here. That was just flat yeah. out amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I love what I do. I love what I do. And you know, it was so funny though, too, Travis, is that I often talk about you know, we're most of us, including myself, we can get we can get really scared about communication. You know, a lot of us are attempting or avoiding a tough conversation. And in the nonprofit world, y'all have a lot of tough conversations. <laughs> but the faster that you can get confident about navigating them successfully, the, the closer you get to having the life that you want and getting what you want, which isn't manipulative. It's actually just thoughtful and strategic to say, how can I go have a conversation with somebody that's going to be difficult and turn it into a profitable one? So I come away feeling better. They come away feeling better. We're more connected and I'm closer to what it is that I want. Oh, absolutely. I've noticed throughout my time in, in this life, whether in the military or wife or just situation in general, we walk away from certain conversations or interactions kind of feeling like attacked or let down or whatever. And what I found, you know, just from personal interactions is most of the time, the other person has no idea you felt that way. They had no idea the interaction that they had with you that you feel bad about it. And I end up talking to a lot of ladies that are like, well, should I just go like, how do I approach? I'm like, just go tell them like, hey, that thing you did yesterday, that really bugged me. And then usually the answer is, oh, I had no idea that it bugged you. I, you know, I've moved so many times that I'm a lot more comfortable with people right up front than they are with letting new people in their life. Cause I've just been exposed to so many new people move after move, after move, after move, after 50, five, zero moves, like walking into a crowd of people that I don't know and making friends and media easy for me. It wasn't always, but it is now, but I would find that I'm much more comfortable right away than they are. So I'll just be letting it hang out, like whatever the thing, whatever the conversation is. And someone will look at me funny and be like, Oh, was I too comfortable there? 
Yeah, I get I get that way. Don't <laughs> don't feel bad. It's not you. I'm just really comfortable. When you let me know when you catch up, and then we can you know continue. But that's a gift. I mean, that's a gift to make it again to connect with somebody. And so many times, it really goes back. You said something that I think is very common for all of us, and that is it can be very difficult to express a more sensitive emotion. The idea that maybe my feelings were hurt, or maybe um, I was offended, or maybe something went awry and it kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. And what happens is, is that perhaps we'll just say that like that person said it one time. We then replay the conversation in our own head over and over and over and over again, right? A thousand times and give it a lot more energy than probably it deserves. But we also give it way more energy because we don't know how to channel that because we weren't taught emotional literacy. We weren't taught communication skills. So you can take a public speaking course in high school. You can take a public speaking course as an adult. What there isn't is a course that says, here's how you just talk in relationships. Here's how you just use your voice at work. And so that's why I got so excited about what I do is that it's like, well, when I can make it practical, when I can actually give you a key phrase or a key framework, then we're going to change the outcome. And sometimes too, it's going back not even just to expand the vocabulary beyond mad, sad, and glad, which are like the three emotions we've all been taught, you know, but, but it's going back to saying, here are words that heal. And there's been no class for that. That's really kind of disappointing that there isn't a class for that. And as I've been learning and navigating through my, you know, maturation and adulthood, I've been told that I understand what glad is. I understand what blah is, but I don't know the difference between something that's sad and something that makes you mad. I just get mad at both. Like, this is ridiculous. And like, that's not really like ridiculous. It's just kind of a, you know. Well, and that's because you haven't typically had somebody to model that for you or to to expand Mm -hmm. your vocabulary. I mean, I, in one of my classes, I literally teach emotional literacy and I'll say, we like, what are all the synonyms for sad? And people will look at you and they're like, mad and it's like no no no. it's not a dr seuss game it's what, like, it, it's what, like, what rhymes with sad exactly it's <laughs> like it's it's literally it's like it's the disheartened you know it, it's the it's the distressed it's the heartbroken and, and they're like oh yeah 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 and that that's just not a part of our common vocabulary but that's like that's a beautiful thing too is to just to use your example as a story and to role play for somebody to go back and say hey you know i thought i could let it go which is a brilliant thing to say but it's still on my mind. Can we talk about what happened yesterday? Can we go back and revisit what happened yesterday? Or you don't even have to ask for permission. Permission. You can just say, I'd really like to revisit yesterday because I thought I could let it go, but I can't. And our relationship matters to me. This is important. Now notice what I've done. I've told you that something's still bothering me, but I've also assured you that our relationship matters to me. In other words, you're not in trouble. I'm not about to yell at you. There's no reason for you to be defensive. I just care about us and this matters to me. And that allows a person to be far more receptive to whatever it is you need to share. See, I just, I just yell up front just so they know what conversation we're going to about to have. <laughs> we need to talk like the world's worst <laughs> words. We need to talk. And everybody's like, Oh, gird your loins. <laughs> I, I of course don't do that. Uh, when I was enlisted and much younger in my career, I, I found myself yelling a fair amount. And then once I got commissioned and I started understanding other leadership roles, like it was very rare that I would raise my voice and let, you know, safety was about like, oh, you know, look out, you know, whatever the thing is, but it, you know, it, it changes as you, as you move and you grow and you, you learn all these different things and different ways to do this, but you have some great things, some fantastic tools for us. We're going to get into talking about aligning brilliance tool. We might even get into self-leadership mindset and the CT far tool, Talk about some magical All my favorites. Phrases. Oh, you're hitting my favorites. Oh, yeah. This is good. All the good stuff. We're going to talk about magical phrases like the one you just mentioned and get into the five steps of how we really can get it, whatever that it is. So, so excited to have you today. Thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest, Amy Kay. I'm excited about it. Are you excited? I, I'm more than excited because I believe in this and that, and my clients have proven that it works. So You've mentioned aligning brilliance. It's one of my all-time favorite tools. And I don't say that with an ego. I take no credit for it. It's been around since the days of Aristotle. And I got it from an agent who worked in the NFL. He used it as one of his um, strongest negotiating tools. And the reason that it works so well is because most of us, Travis, when we start a meeting, when we get together with other people, human behavior is to talk about what's broken, 
talk about what needs fixing, talk about what's not working. And I don't know about you, but if I ever go to a meeting and it turns into a total vent session, I'm like, I can't get that hour of my life back again. So I really like productive and structured meetings that are forward focused. And this framework does it. And it does it through a series of questions. So one of the beautiful things is it says, okay, instead of starting with all the things that are broken, that are not working, instead of talking about compliance, like Travis, why can't you do your job? And then being all backward focused and focusing on the problem, Aligning Brilliant says, we're going to get together and here's the agenda. We're going to talk about strengths. We're going to talk about what's working. We're going to talk about our aligned objectives, what it is that we want. We're going to talk about the benefit when we get it, not if, but that pre-assumptive close of when we knock it out of the park, how do you benefit, Travis? How do I benefit? How does the entire cause benefit? And then, and only then, do we talk about our concerns, things that are within our control, things that are outside of our control. And then the final sixth step is tweaks. And that's what do we want to do more of better in addition to, to ensure our future success. And now we're co-creating the future together. So I I think this is a fabulous team exercise and the timing couldn't be better to either do it at the end of a quarter, halfway through the year, end of an initiative or project or fundraising campaign. Um, it can be about a group. It can be about a project or campaign. And you just sit there and you go strengths, what's working, objectives, payoff slash benefits, tweaks and concerns, uh, excuse me, concerns and then tweaks. And it's just a brilliant framework. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I love that you, are able to frame up what it is that you're doing, look at the things and not just start on the negative. Because, I mean, there are some people that are so highly skilled that they can stay in the negative all day, every day. And when oh, you start it's a there, gift. <laughs> when you start there, sometimes it's hard to get out, especially when there just is so much good out there. You know, and it is. And so what I always say too, because I'm, I'm used to doing it. I've done it thousands, not an exaggeration. I've done it in thousands of conversations since I first... Um, found the tool in the mid nineties. And one of the things that people will often give me pushback on is they'll say, but what if you have exactly what you have that Dougie Downer or, you know, that Eeyore who just can't get off the cynical or the negative. And I say, I hear you. And we're going to get to that. And you will, you'll get to that when you get to concerns, but here's the difference. When you talk about concerns first, it's venting. When you talk about concerns after strengths, what's working, what we want and why we want it, now you're talking about the things that are going to block your progress. So you go straight to problem solving with tweaks. And now it's more like, oh, this is how we're moving ourselves forward. This is how we can take action versus let's just all sit around and complain. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas I've seen this work really well, I don't know if it's the exact framework, but the pilots in my community, in the E6B community, when they go and they debrief a flight, they just talk about it in order and the phases. You've got the planning, you file. You do, you do the pre-flight, you sign for the maintenance, you get everyone together, you go through the takeoff routine, you take off, climb out, and then you have different situations that happen throughout the flight, depending on what we're doing, and then the landing and the wrap-up and the maintenance, all this stuff. And they just go through it kind of in order. Hey, you did this well, this was here. This we got to talk about, it needs some tweaks here. You know, did you do the learning? They're like, oh, yeah, I didn't learn. And then like, oh, this was really good. You were really strong here. They just go right through the flow, and it's very matter-of-fact. It's very plain, and it's not accusatory. And because they do every single event the same way it's just part of the, the routine and flow and it's not like i can't believe what you did on this flight there's none of that because you get into the right routine and the right flow and it just makes sense and no one gets all in a in an uproar about whatever they end up talking about whether it was good or bad no i love that and that's a habit of excellence i mean that's just a prime example of a habit of excellence which is partially why I love this tool and framework as well is because it says the habit of was we're going to build on what worked. We're going to start with our strengths. And that's a really great way that everybody can start to adapt. The other thing that I love about what it is that you're saying too, is that a really great definition of accountability is not the blame game. A really great definition of accountability is we all accepted the assignment for the care and management of X. So rather than pointing fingers of, oh, Travis's fault, oh, Amy Kay's fault, it's like, no, 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 there might be some breakdowns. There might be some gaps. We, there might be areas of improvement, but we all accepted the assignment for the care and management of this project. So let's accept the assignment for making it better together, collectively. And that's another reason that I love the Aligning Brilliance tool is that it says your voice matters. So notice that it's, I'm asking questions. I'm not telling you. 
it's all a question-based framework is what are the strengths? What's working? Are we aligned? Meaning we're going to co-create a better future. You get to help problem solve, but your voice matters. And this is so great. So Travis, you can also use it at home. So this is a fun story. I gave this keynote um, in Chicago to a bunch of bankers and I, and, I'm, and I don't exaggerate. I If anything, I'm going to downplay this. So let's say there's around 500 people in the room. I'm done with my keynote. This guy raises his hand and he's like, and I was like, what? He's like, you know, that tool that you shared, you know, I'm like, oh, the aligning brilliance was like, yeah, He's like, whatever. What I really need to know is, can I use it on my wife? And I was like, yes, yes, you totally can, but technical foul. He's like, what? And I was like, lose the worksheet, insert alcohol. And he's like, no, 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 I'm serious. And I was like, me too, dude, me too. But it is a fantastic relationship and family tool. You could sit down at the dinner room, excuse me, the dining room table over dinner. And you might say, what are the strengths of our family? What's working as a family? What do we want as a family? What's the benefit when we all get what we want? Now you can skip concerns. Your kids don't need to vent. You could go straight to tweaks and you could say, so what are we all going to do more of better in addition to, or you could do it as a relationship tool. So you could go back and you could say, Hey honey, you know, what are the strengths of our relationship? What's working in our relationship? And you could walk through the tool. Fantastic way to improve your partnership without those dreaded words, honey, we need to talk. That's like a, it's like a cuss word, isn't it, honey? We need to talk. It, it is definitely a four, a four letter word. <laughs> I, don't, I can't think of a situation where we need to talk is a great intro to something positive. Yeah, no. And it's, and, but that's also just a bad habit. So we talked about habits of excellence earlier. A really bad habit is the honey that we need to talk. That's the opposite of how you want to say it. Because immediately when I hear those words, I get defensive. But if I can sit down and say, in fact, um, I do magical phrases. I'm known for magical phrases. I'm a curator of magical phrases. And sometimes the hardest thing to do can be starting a tough conversation, Travis. And so instead of doing the honey, we need to talk. I love to say, this is hard and it's important, or I need to have a difficult conversation with you, but our relationship really matters to me. And what I'm saying is this is tough for me. But most importantly is our relationship. And I want to, I want to do something that actually shores that up. And that's a whole different um, way to begin a conversation than, you know, the dreaded honey, we need to talk. And it's much less accusatory. I feel like if you say, honey, we need to talk, it immediately follows the finger point is that you. Oh yeah, you're in trouble. You've done something wrong. I'm mad. I'm upset. Yeah. It's all the stories, all that scripted narrative, all those false assumptions behind it. And that's why it's so beautiful. I don't believe in scripting. Like in our sales training, I won't, I won't teach scripting, but I do believe in that brilliant back pocket one-liner that can course correct, that can help you navigate choppy water successfully and get to shore with another person and feel connected when you do arrive at that new place, that new destination. I just love the way you frame all of this stuff, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, my heart is full for this. And I think, I think Travis, it, it, it really became so full for me because bad conversations are just painful. They just hurt everybody involved. And so when you can do a little prep ahead of time to make sure that it's just a thoughtful, productive conversation, everybody wins. Mm. You know, there was a time in my life, maybe my, my earlier mid twenties where you're like, oh, well, it's not my job to sugarcoat whatever the thing is. I just, I gotta go in and say it and then, you know, whatever. And I did an interview with Bob Berg and he mentioned that people that are focused on being brutally honest are more, more focused on being brutal than being honest. That's and, good. It's true. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's Bob Berg. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Right. We like Bob. We believe in Bob. That is we, true. We, we love Bob. Check out my interview with Bob Berg. Go back in the, uh, you'll think I'll probably just link this one to that one. So you can just get it at the end of the screen. If you're on my website, I mean, his little happy face there to click on Bob. Um, but when I started changing the way I had this discussion, because after I learned about, you know, being brutally honest, how it's not the best you know, method. And I think I'm learning the best methods right now from you, but my inner intermediate in there, I would be like, that's great that you want to say that. And that's great that you have, you know, the backbone to want to say that and convey that. But is the way you said it, does that accomplish your goal? Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. And I think one of the things that's so important to remember is that you can set boundaries. You know, Mm -hmm. you don't have to be a doormat. You can have 
um, very direct conversations with people, but you don't have to be a bully. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be rude. What you do have to do is prepare to be thoughtful. And so a lot of times I talk, um, especially to women in our, in our She Gets It program, but I talk about how you need to role play. You need to show up and say, this is how I want to frame the conversation. This is, these are sort of the, the key strategic phrases or questions that I want to ask. This is the point. This is the mood. This is the tone. And then what might they say? What might they um, say as a reaction? How, how might they respond to me that I want to be prepared so that I'm not completely blindsided? And then the other thing that I tell people too is that one of the very best things that you can do to role play is to not give your power away. So if somebody says something that does blindside you or that you find egregious or offensive or just completely shocks you, then your default is to, you don't have to react. Your default could be, oh, Travis, I wasn't expecting you to say that, or I am caught off guard. I need a moment, or I'm not sure how to process that. And that way you're not just reacting and escalating a situation. You're actually taking control of the narrative and the outcome. Oh man, I love that. I love that all again. But this aligning brilliance tool, I love the way we lay that out in a way it just, it makes sense and is productive. Huge fan of productive conversations. Me there's, too, me too. <laughs> there's so many ways to make it destructive. And in fact, whether we know it or not, we ex we experiment in destructive conversations all the time because we don't have a better tool. But thank you so much for plagiarizing and then giving credit to Aristotle for what this looks oh, like. Oh, for sure. Oh my gosh, I can't take credit for it at all. All I did was, you know, give it a modern application for sure. Oh yes, I invented this amazing tool that if you do the research on, you'll find it's, you know, thousands of years old. So yes. Everyone quick, see how great Amy K is. Come on in. Oh, it's hysterical. <laughs> I really want to get into and talk to about the book get it because I get the chance to get the read ahead. Thank you so much for saying that to me. So I can look through and it's such a great conversation and the five steps to get whatever you want. And you include these magical phrases in there, which I know you want to share. And I want to ask you about what does this look like this, these five different steps to get anything that you want? What does that look like? It really looks more about ironically helping somebody else get what they want first. So it's the law of rec uh, reciprocity. And so one of the things that I think is that it sounds like, get, you know, get what you want. Oh, is this a really selfish book? It's actually the opposite. It says, I can get farther by helping you first. And so it's no different than, and I'll give it a great example. Like we're, we were preparing for today's podcast. You know, I can come on, I can be like, these are all the things that I want to talk about. And then it's a conversation with me, myself, and I, that's not helpful. But when I sit down with you and I say, well, Travis, what's most important to your listenership? You know, what can we share that adds value? That's then how we end up having a fun conversation that creates a win-win-win for everybody. A win for you, a win for me, a win for listeners. And so magical phrases are just a way of saying, I need to connect with somebody first. And most conversations, we don't do that. Most conversations, we go in kind of like we talked about earlier, we go in with this bombastic, here's what I want give it to me. In fact, here's a great story. So I was coaching somebody just two weeks ago and they were like, can I ask for a raise like at the end of the pandemic? And I was like, well, of course you can. It's just how you ask it. And like, okay, well, here's my email. I need a raise. I was like, okay, delete, 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 delete. You know, <laughs> Let, let's use the first magical phrase of how might we? Mm -hmm. So I believe in this phrase, how might we? And how might we says the world is full of possibilities. We means we're going to co-create the future together. And we're going to do it together in the sense that we don't have to discern or come up with a definitive decision today because we're, we're looking at the possibilities. But this how might we, and then I said, it's not how might we get you a raise. What's in it for the other person? Where's, where's their forecast for the next six months? What do they need? What do they want? And I said, and you're going to your boss. So the very first thing that we want to do is we would say, how might we make me a more integrated, successful team player. Or if you want to use the I, if you want it to be a how might I, which is another version of the same magical phrase, it could be how might I become a more integrated, successful team player. And then we're going to jujitsu this conversation with the aligning brilliance tool. So what are my strengths? What are the team strengths? What's working for me, the team? What are my objectives? Are we aligned on it? What's the benefit when I knock it out of the park? Here's some of my concerns and here's a tweak. I'd really like to step up in responsibility and I would like my salary to be commensurate or to match that. I said, you're going to be far more likely to get a raise when your boss sees how energetic, how productive, 
how much you want to elevate your performance than if you just go in and say, Travis, I need a raise. You've built and, a whole case around it now. Yeah, and the raise is, is a, it's a micro, it's the end of a micro journey, right? It's not part of yes. the journey. The overall, it's, the, it's the kind of the goal of the micro journey. And oh, who was it? Jim Rohn was like, Make a you know, set a goal to make a million dollars, not because of what the million dollars is, but because who you need to become in order to earn the million dollars. Exactly. And that's exactly what I'm saying is who am I going to become as an integrated, successful team player to add more value, mm -hmm. to allow us to scale and grow and meet and exceed our next stretch goals. And then as a reflection of the added value that I contribute, um, as, as I continue to ensure my commitment to our growth then there's a reflection back in salary. And again, that creates a win-win. And the other thing that's important too is that phrase, just that whole framework says, I'm committed to our future excellence and then I want to be compensated. And so I'm not going to cost you any more than I'm costing you today if I'm contributing more, producing more, and we're having a more profitable outcome. And so you get a, you get a very different result when you have that type of conversation. And that's just, that's just one way to use a how might we. You can fill it in with anything. How might we successfully um, finish this project? How might we begin phase one? How might we increase our fundraising? How might we attract you know, a bigger community? How might we launch a new campaign? It, it's whatever your meeting is about. Just start it with a how might we question. And these are fantastic questions, especially, I know we're, we're focusing really on, on all sorts of people, but when you, when you take that and you dissect it down into, you know, the nonprofit world, this might be a way to, you know, segue into conversations with your executive director or your founder or your board of directors, or maybe someone working for you, maybe your fundraiser, or as a staff as a whole, you know, how do we connect with donors better? It might be you're in a meeting with a donor. How might we help you? create your vision. And it's a whole different conversation that is like, hey, you gave us money last year. You think you could give us some more money? That'd be well, super. That's brilliant, Travis. That's an excellent example. So how might we expand and grow your impact? How might we expand and grow your legacy? Well, that's a whole different question than can you write us another check? I mean, <laughs> think about that. I mean, it's, it's kind of that fascinating connection with somebody's desire to play bigger, to serve more, to do, to, to do more with their life and have an even more significant role with their limited time on the, in their one wild and precious life on this planet. And for you to say, how might we expand your capacity? How might we expand your impact? How might we increase your legacy? That's a beautiful thing to remind them that that's what they're doing far beyond writing a check. Oh, absolutely. How, can, how might we get your employees more involved with helping us co-create your vision love it oh, yes yeah. yes another I, one Doug. it's good it's all good magical phrase number one how might we what's our next magical phrase so the next one is would you be willing and i love this and especially in a nonprofit world so would you be willing and, and and this is just let's just talk human behavior nobody likes to be told what to do everybody loves to be asked and I know that there are a myriad of scenarios where we've been told, including your incredible service to our great country, where you're just, you're following a lot of directions. But in a nonprofit world, when I say, hey, Travis, would you be willing? I'm giving you a sense of control of your own volition that you can say yes. Now, I know you're already volunteering, but it's a respectful thing to say, would you be willing to call these five people? Would you be willing to start the meeting? Would you be willing to write, you know, the draft of this press release? Would you be willing to fill in the blank? And then there's a couple things. Somebody might come back and say, I ain't willing. And you're like, oh, okay, well, what would you be willing to do? So again, you're asking them and you're giving them a sense of control. Now here is a mind meld of awesomeness. So if, you, if, you're, if you're multitasking right now while you're listening to this podcast, tune in for this because this is a great one, especially at home and in the nonprofit world. If you do a would you be willing, which is a magical phrase with guided choices, which is a magical sales technique, you are far more likely to elevate the chance of getting what you want. So it sounds like this at home. Would you be willing to unload the dishwasher, set the table, or feed the dog? Now, all three of those chores need to be done. But the minute that I say to the kids, would you be willing? And I fill in this list of two to three chores, they're going to pick something. They're going to be like, ah, I'd be willing to like set the table. Excellent. One down, two to go, right? But you're getting them to say yes to something that you need anyway. So I call it a would you be willing 
followed by guided choices. Now, you probably can't tell by my energy that 25 years ago, I taught elementary school. That was like my very first job on the planet. But I used to do this with my fifth and sixth graders. I would say, okay, here's a guided choice. Do you want to read this book, this book, or this book? And they're like, oh, Ms. Hutchins, you let us read whatever we want. I'm like, excellent. It has to be one of these three, but I'm glad you think you get to do whatever you want. And that's the beauty of the human psychology of saying, yes, I get to choose of my own accord how I'm going to play. And by the way, in the world of volunteer, you get much better performance in behaviors when people say yes of their own accord than when you're telling them what to do. Oh, yeah, I, I can definitely understand that. It, the military lifestyle, there's a lot of talk about orders and this and that. Uh, and when I started more than 20 years ago, fully on, like, do the thing, do it now while I'm yelling at you and you better have a smile while you're doing it. And now it's it's really more of a partnership because, I mean, people are going and they're, they're fully educated. They have bachelor's degrees and more. They're coming in with this, this heart of service and really wanting to connect and, and have a greater purpose. And you don't have to be so abrasive in order to get things done. Like, hey, yeah. you mind running out and taking care of this for me? It's a no problem, especially if they understand the why behind it. If they understand the why behind it, they can get on board with, with anything, whoever it is, volunteer or well, otherwise. And Travis, you bring up a really great point that when we have respectful communication, then in those moments when we are a little bit more directive or there is a greater sense of urgency or our tone is a little bit sharper because we're under stress, people are far more understanding for, and forgiving because it's a one-off. It's the exception to the respectful communication that we're practicing 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I love it. I absolutely love it. Would you be willing to be my guest on this podcast? Yes, exactly. And then, and then here's another, so here's the third magical phrase. So if somebody says to you, um, let's say somebody asks you and they don't say, would you be willing? But somebody says like, I need you like to do X, Y, or Z. And it's, it's actually not going to happen, right? It's not that it's egregious, but maybe you just can't do it. Then instead of just saying no, which creates a complete disconnect, you say, I'm unwilling to do, or I can't do, fill in the blank with whatever they asked you. But then there's this beautiful follow on magical phrase, but here's what I am willing to do. Mm. And this is a complete 180 to come back and say, okay, I've said no, but now I'm coming back to connect with you on the flip side of that and to say, here's what I am willing to do. So for instance, if you'd said, um, Travis to me, hey, Amy Kay, can you fly uh, to Kansas City? I really like to do my podcast in person. I'd be like, oh, Travis, I'm unable to fly, but here's what I am willing to do. I, I can hop on a Zoom call and it'll just, it'll be like, just like I'm in person, and, and, you know, that I'm there. And what I'm saying is, and this is the beauty of this, I'm on your side. I'm still committed to your success. I can't do it exactly as you asked, but I'm still excited to, and commitment, um, and my commitment to you is a profitable outcome. And that is a fantastic way to show people that you still care about what's important for them. I love that. That is very, that is very other person focused. When I've been in that situation of where my boss needs me to do something, or if you're like an office space, you're like, I've got seven bosses, Bob. Like when someone asked me to do something, I already have this mountain of things to do. I said, well, I'm working on this, this, and this. Where does what you're asking fit into my priorities? And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, I didn't realize you were so engaged in other things. Or they'll be like, huh, I'm willing to tell all those bosses, too bad, so sad, I need this at your, at your number one. But it allows me to ask the question of, dude, is what you really need that important without sounding like I just sounded? No, and that's, and that's a classic example. And that's so important to me because when, when I teach this stuff, I talk about finding your tone, your tenor, your words for your personality. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of you doing the, really the same magical phrase with your tone and tenor. And that's just coming back and saying, this is really important to you. So it matters to me. I've got a list of seven things to do. How do you want these priorities to shift? You know, what, what do you want me to like move back so that we can prioritize this? That's your polite way of saying, I can't do all seven today. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> but instead of being like, you know, you're an idiot, that ain't happening. Or you're, you're, you're ridiculous. That ain't happening. What you're saying is, oh, I can see this is really important to you. You gave me seven other things to do today. Which one would you like me to shift to ensure that we get the most important, that we prioritize the most important? That's another way of saying, I'm still committed to you and I'm still committed to your success, but I can't do it. And that's a great way. Yeah, it's really under, 
important to understand Travis's tone and tenor. And I know how much you love alliteration. That's why I said that way. I'm still waiting for your next podcast, Taboo Topics with Travis. <laughs> oh, I guess I guess the cat's out of the bag now. We're talking about yeah, this. No, no, no. I'm podcast. just saying I'm waiting for it. And I'll be your first listener if you ever do something like that. <laughs> Otherwise, you can you can just cut this out of the podcast and be like, oh, we had a technical difficulty. <laughs> uh, technically, Amy K is being difficult. I think that's what it is. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh I absolutely love these conversations. I need another magical phrase. You've got me hooked. I've got the- Yes, oh my God, I have have so many of them. So one of the things that I think is really important, and I'm going to do a little bit of a different perspective on this one. Sometimes when we're in a tough conversation and emotions are high, we get a physiological response in our body and it's normal. So our, our throats can tighten or our chest will tighten or our tear ducts in our eyes will, will well up. Maybe we'll blush, we'll turn red. And so many people get really embarrassed by this and then they feel like they have to apologize. So the first thing that I'm gonna tell you inside your own mind is to tell yourself the magical phrase of, well, this is important to me, right? You know, this is, this is my body showing me that I care. And then when you can take that deep breath, that's what you're gonna tell the person that's sitting in front of you. And you're just gonna say, hold, clearly this matters to me. Mm-hmm. And that's all you're gonna say. You're not going to say, oh, Travis, I'm so sorry. Oh, Travis, 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 Travis. I can't talk because now you're just getting more um, worked up and you're not giving your body a chance to relax so that you can breathe and move through the conversation. Mm-hmm. So what I encourage people to do is to just look at the person and say, hold, clearly this matters to me. And then give your body a chance. They'll wait. The minute that you say that, you know, hold, clearly this matters to me, they'll wait. And then on the flip side, Travis, this is a beautiful gift to say to somebody else when they're hurting or they're upset. You could reach out to them and just say, hold, deep breath, clearly this matters to you. And just be that patient listener. Give them the gift of grace to say, this is hard for them. They're clearly having a physiological response, which is a reaction to the heightened emotions in their body. So for you to give them the gift of saying, clearly this matters to you and your willingness to wait. It's just a beautiful verbal gift. You know, I don't know if I'm that gracious yet to to take that one on, but I'm taking notes because I need to be that gracious. What you mentioned about our desire to want to apologize. I spend in my, my daily interactions, I make it a point to tell normally ladies, like when you you bump into someone or whatever, and they say, sorry, I'm like, Mm -hmm. do not apologize. You didn't do anything wrong. If you're looking for another word, you can say, excuse me, the appropriate word. But by you saying you're sorry, you're like accepting fault. I mean, we bumped it. Like it's a huge busy place where everyone's kind of moving around. Like, don't, apo- don't, don't please don't apologize for something that needs no apology. Please, please, please. And I, t- I end up talking to a lot of ladies that are they're just conditioned. Like somehow that's the nice thing to do when it really is almost self-deprecating. I mean, do you, do you look at it the same way? I look at it exactly the same way. We're conditioned to apologize for taking up space. It's like somebody bumps into us and, you know, in the coffee line and we're like, oh, oh, sorry. And it's, it's just a habit. And so now it's been in the practice and I love what you're suggesting coming up with another phrase. So one of, one of my phrases is, oh, hi. And, and, and just making that my new habit. So like somebody bumps into me, I'm like, oh, hi. And it's, it's, and they'll, sometimes they look at you like you have three heads, but what you haven't done is apologize for them not looking where they're going. And and you haven't apologized for just standing somewhere. Now, sometimes, and this is me, because I have to be honest, sometimes the words come out faster than I can even think. And I'll be like, oh, sorry. And I'm like, oh, darn it, there it is again. But that's self-awareness. And that's catching myself so that the next time I can be like, oh, hi. And it's finding your phrase that becomes your next habit. And one of the things that I think that is so important for women, especially to, to realize is that, When you have that reaction, when you're feeling um, concerned or upset and you're having difficulty talking, what you end up doing is saying, I'm sorry that that this matters to me. I'm sorry that I care. I'm sorry that this is so important to me. And that's not what you want to apologize for. So just finding that phrase of hold, clearly this matters to me is a way of you saying, we'll get through this. This is important to me, but I'm not going to apologize because I care. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And if you bump into someone in the Midwest or the upper Midwest, you can just say, oh, 
oh, <laughs> or or like or like my girlfriend says she's like oopsie doopsie and i'm like okay i can't get away with that but you can so i'll let you have that one i'm not an oopsie doopsie kind of guy i'm not either so you got to know your tone and tenor where we're teaching these lessons by real examples <laughs> i'm not an oopsie doopsie either but i am an oh hi <laughs> oh hi nice to meet you <laughs> the reason why exactly. i asked you here was like Funny I ran into you. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you got the memo. We're all showing up here. Good. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. And then I'll, I'll, I'll share one more magical phrase because I think, I think this is one of the most beautiful. This is definitely in my top five. And it's a part of me. Mm -hmm. And a part of me is this gorgeous phrase when you need to uh, communicate a sensitive emotion. So if you're upset, if you're frustrated, if you're annoyed, if you're angry, and you tell somebody that you feel that way, it comes across as an absolute. So if I say, Travis, I'm frustrated, then you're like, oh, any case, 100% frustrated. And, and you don't give it that in your mind, but that's what you perceive is that, oh, she's only frustrated. And then tensions rise or you get defensive, exactly. And so what I often encourage people to do is say, a part of me is frustrated. And when you say a part of me is frustrated, a part of me is annoyed, a part of me is disappointed, what you've now communicated to the person is that there's other parts that are more positive. There's other parts of you that still respect them. And in a personal relationship, you still love them. You know, you're still wanting to connect with them. It's just a great way to communicate a sensitive emotion so that the conversation can actually be seen all the way through versus somebody getting instantly defensive. You know, I've heard something like this in the military, only it sounds a little bit defensive. Like it's a part of me wants to chop you in the throat right now. But like, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> we've all part got of those, me wants to kill you right now. We've all got those, yeah. those young sailors or the young, you know, uh, young enlisted people, you know, late teens, early twenties, and they do something and like, it's out of bounds. And you're like, oh, you know, a part of me just wants to chop you in the throat right now, but and it's like, ooh, <laughs> ooh, I guess it's a little bit more serious than I thought it was. Um, well, but, but that is also a hilarious way to say, you know, a part of me is, is like totally ready to like grab you by the earlobe. And a part <laughs> of me is, is just like, you know, so frustrated. But what you're, again, the minute that you say a part of me, psychologically, the human brain says, ooh, there's other parts where maybe Travis isn't so bad at me or, or that Travis gets me or that Travis, you know, was, was in his 20s once. And so- that allows for connection to mm -hmm. take place. When you use the words, a part of me, to deliver a sensitive emotion, what you're really creating space for is human connection so that you're telling somebody, I understand you. Mm. I love that phrase, creating space. I have a friend of mine, Stephen Kuhn, that I've also interviewed, go back in the backlog for that. One of his big things is creating space and allowing someone to step into their greatness because I'm not going to show up to a meeting or a coaching session or whatever the thing is and just be the end all be all know all the stuff or whatever. Like as long as I've been podcasting and as long as I've been in leadership position, as long as I've been doing a lot of things, I still understand that there's a lot I don't know. It might not be about the topic per se, but it might be about you. I'm not sure where you are, where you're going, what you're, what you're coming up with today, where exactly we're going to go with this conversation or what it is. So I have to create the space and know that I'm not the only one in the room. Just like you mentioned before, like when we're getting ready for the interview, it's not about what Amy K wants or what Amy K is going to say. And that's what Amy K is going to do. That's not how we approach this thing. It's about creating the space to figure out what exactly we're going to talk about today. And we kind of knew what we were going to talk about today, but we didn't exactly know what we we're talking about today. And that allows the conversation to be fluid and move and grow and change. But I really want to hop on the, the get it book and talk about those five things to really understand how to create this change, how to figure out how to get whatever you want. And I was looking through the book, you know, you talk about some of the things like clarifying what you really want. I think it's the, the first step. And I'm at the point right now, even with all the things that I've done and the things that I've accomplished and the life that I have and what I'm doing, I'm at the precipice of retiring from the military. How can that be when you look like you're 25? 
<laughs> You've got I, I'm for for those of you who are not watching this, who are listening to this. I mean, Travis has this like beautiful, and it's not a Zoom filter. He's got this beautiful expression on his face, and he looks like a young man. So as he says retirement, I'm like, bah, that can't be true. <laughs> well, if you think I'm 25, you must be 29. So let's not uh, my new let's best not mistake friend. that. My new best friend. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. We're besties on Zoom. Uh, I love it. But like, what is this? What are these steps? How can people get whatever they want? Well, let's, okay, so let me ask you a couple way. questions. Let's do yeah. some real time yeah. coaching here. Let, okay, let's make this. Coaching. And this is for those who are listening. This is not where we thought it was going to go. But let's do it because this is great. And this is real. And this is important because it's your life. I think more important than what you want to do next. My question for you is who are you up to being? And then how do you want to feel along the way? and when you get there. And those are two different things. So if, if I say, who are you up to being? You're like, huh, that's a, that's a kind of a provocative question of how I wanna play in the world and what I need to, as you just beautifully said, what kind of space do I need to step into? And what skill sets do I need to grow? Or what kind of character traits do I need to develop to lead into this next exciting chapter? And then how do I wanna feel both in the journey and in the destination? So a lot of times, and we'll give a classic example with money. You know, a lot of people will be like, well, I just, I just want a million dollars. And I'm like, well, how will that make you feel when you have it? And then it'll make me feel free. And I'm like, well, until you feel free now, you will never get that million dollars because it's the feeling of freedom right here, right now that propels you into the actions and the behaviors that attract that a million dollars and allow you to create the space to make it happen. But if you wait to feel free, you'll always be waiting for that million dollars. And that to me is just how it works. The world reflects back to you, your mindset. It's, it's, not, it's not the other way around. When I look at what I want my next kind of, I don't know, venture or phase or whatever the thing is I want to be in, it's like, someone's like, what, what do you really want? And I want to be in a place financially that allows me to say, if, any, if, I, if anyone needs my help anywhere in the world, I want to be at a place where my, finances and my schedule allows me to, hey, we need you here tonight in New York City to do this thing. Our keynote speaker dropped out. We need you. I want to, yep, I want to be there for you. You're my buddy. I'm not worried about the finances. I'm not worried about the schedule. I'm not worried about any of this stuff. I want to be able to show up for the people that really need whatever the thing is. That's what I really want. Okay. So, so what I hear in that, which is so beautiful, is that you want freedom and you want flexibility to serve generously. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Okay. So then how can you start today serving generously? Well, now, hello, you recorded a podcast today, right? But that's, that's the mindset. You don't wake up and say, I need more money. You no. wake up and say, how do I serve generously in such a way that I can continue to grow my freedom, my flexibility to create an even bigger impact and to serve more? And then how do I want to channel that energy? Like where, cause you don't want to do everything. I mean, I, I, I kind of joke, I don't ever want to run a tequila company, but I am so glad there are those people who do. Like, I love my margarita, right? But I, I don't want to run a margarita or tequila factory. Like, I know that about myself. Right. And yet, that gives me all kinds of other options about how I can channel my energy. And so for me, and I'm not, I'm not woo-woo about this. My, my background is in cognitive science and, and how we learn. And I studied the brain in grad school, and we are energetic beings. And so how do you stay in this high energy state? Well, it's choosing to do things that you love. And it isn't like follow your passion and the money will, will come after that because sometimes <laughs> you're passionate about things you don't have a strength in. Um, but it's, it's really sitting at that intersection of talent and passion and commitment and then saying, is this how I show up best to serve? And then who must I become to lead into that next chapter? And I think those are brilliant questions to answer. Oh, absolutely. And just so you and I and everyone listening is on the same page, that's what I do. I show yeah. it for people, whether it's on Zoom or in person and it connect is. and say, how can I best serve you? And how can we move together? And what can we do to help you reach your goal? I do that stuff already. And look at how much you've grown and how quickly you've grown. I mean, yeah, Travis, there are people who started podcasts long before you that have not been as successful as you. And that's because you show up daily saying, how can I serve generously? That's how you want to feel. I, absolutely. And I, I've said this before. I, my goal is to provide value without expectation. And that's how I, well, do it. And that's that's, how I live my life. 
And that's a beautiful thing because then you do it altruistically, which can then gives it a whole different energy because resentment is not the path you want to be on. The, the martyrdom is not the path that you want to be on. And this is, this is something that I'll say provocatively, knowing that we're, we're really and truly talking to the nonprofit world. When you volunteer, you're allowed for your volunteering to make you feel good. That's, that's a benefit of being human. If I, if I give and it makes me feel good, that, that's an honest way that we can reciprocate energy and emotions. But if you're doing it because you're expecting a pat on the back, or if you're doing it because you're expecting the accolades, you're going to be wildly disappointed. Yes. Wildly disappointed. I was going to have a modifier in there, but no, you know, wildly disappointed. <laughs> wildly disappointed. It, I, you know, and then if you are in the nonprofit world and you're listening to this stuff and you're having a little, well, how can I, in a place of leadership, like really show appreciation for those people that are showing up and volunteering and you're not sure, you just ask them how can yes. I best show you that I appreciate you? Cause I really do. I want to make sure it has an impact and not just do the same thing for everybody. I don't know if you've seen these little videos or TikToks where uh, the teacher, since you've got a teaching background, has a, kid, a bunch of kids lined up and they have a chart and they pick what they want on the chart. They want a hug. If they want their own personalized handshake. If yes, I have seen yes. this. Yes. yes. Now, show me what you want. I'll give it to you. Yep. And they just say, yes. I want this one bam, there's a fist bump. I want this thing. And it's, uh, I don't know, whatever they do. It is. It's, it's, and it's beautiful because it's what the child wanted. Yes, 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 yes. Ask, yeah. ask them what they want. People will tell you if you ask them. Yeah. And that's, that just goes full circle to how we started is that that specific technique to the child says your voice matters. Mm-hmm. I love it. I absolutely love it. And you know, that, that actually reminds me, maybe I'll I'll end on one more magical phrase. And that is the beautiful question of what do you need most from me right now? And Mm. that is a fantastic way to ask again, what somebody else wants or what somebody else needs from you. And it can be in a very sensitive moment. If somebody's hurting or in pain, it could be a very productive, like performance question, like to a direct report or a volunteer. Hey, what do you need most from me right now? In terms of resources, time, energy, it could be that very professional But it can also be that very sensitive if somebody is in pain or is hurting, hey, what do you need most from me right now? But that's one of my all-time favorite questions to say, I'm listening and I'm here to support you and I'm here to set you up for success. What you need matters most. So tell me what it is you need from me and and I'm on it. Perfect. What a great way to wrap it up, Amy Kay. Love the energy, love the insights. I know I speak for everyone to say love the magical phrases. They have such a different impact and they hit you in just the right way that it doesn't hurt like when you're trying to be brutally honest. Well, thank you. I so believe in them and all of my clients have proven them to be great. So I I just appreciate you allowing me to come on and share with your listeners. Absolutely. Please give us any parting comments that you might have, something that you've been dying to share. And then I understand you have a special offer for my audience. Yes. So we have a brand new initiative that we started um, just last year called She Gets It. And you can go to shegetsit.com and our brand new most popular tool, and it's free. So you can go and just download it. Um, It's the how to use your voice. So this is specifically 12 strategies for women who want to be heard at work. And then we also have another, a ton of free tools that in addition to that one, you can certainly um, go to shegetsit.com and join our community and, and get a ton of stuff. And then we do a mastermind twice a year. We do a mastermind in February and September, and we've got a very special code for the nonprofit architect NPA 300. If you go to our mastermind at shegetsit.com forward slash mastermind, and you want to participate, enter the code NPA 300, and we'll give you $300 off exclusive for all of Travis's listeners, um, because we so believe in what you're doing. Oh, thanks, Amy K. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening today. Please hop over to shegetsit.com. And if you're interested in that mastermind, NPA 300, and I'm sure you can connect with Amy, drop her line, send her a message, and she'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, Amy Kay. Thank you, Travis. It's been a delight.